Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome this morning here to Cherrywood in South Dublin to the Air Business and Evros brand launch event. And I think, first of all, big congratulations to everybody who was involved. Big round of applause for them. We have, as you can hear, a small, very socially distanced audience here with us this morning. I'm going to talk a wee bit about what I think is going on in the economy, and then we've got a great launch, panel discussion, ventilation of ideas session for the next hour. So you're at home, you're very, very welcome. Now, I was thinking about what's going on in the economy and where we're at now after the pandemic. And particularly where we're at now that we have the biggest issue of our lifetimes, climate change to deal with. So I picked up this morning's Financial Times and the head, the lead article in the Financial Times is Mark Carney, who was a Irish Catholic Jesuit of Canadian extraction, who was the head of the Bank of England, has put together a fund of $130 trillion of private sector money in order to fight climate change. Now, just to give you a sense of how big $130 trillion is, that's seven times the size of American GDP, of total American GDP. So that's the amount of money being pledged to climate change right now for the next 28 years. And of course, most of that is gonna be spent in the next 10 or 20 years. Now, why is this important to Ireland? is because Ireland is the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy, okay? We know in Ireland, if you've had your staycation the last two years, you get blown away, you take the kids out to Ballybunion, the waves are enormous, but that is a blessing because wind and wave are going to be huge sources of energy. And the challenge for us as a country is moving from being an energy importer to an energy producer and potentially an energy exporter. Now, the reason this is important is that economics is always about energy. Life is about energy. Movement is about energy. So that's the first thing. The big picture for us, incredibly positive right now for this country. Incredibly positive. Enormous opportunity. Then we're going to ask ourselves, into what sort of economy is this new company, this new product being launched? Where are we at right now? And where we're at right now is a very strange place because this was not a recession. You know, we talk about the recovery. This is not a recovery because it wasn't a recession. It's what I call a pandemic. It was a weird thing. The economy was put to sleep. Why? Because we had COVID. So therefore the recovery, i.e. the upswing, is a totally different, different creature. Number one, you might've noticed there's lots of money around. Why? Because people's income didn't actually fall because the government gave everybody checks. So there hasn't been a collapse in income as there usually is after a recession, which is why we feel a cascade of new money into the economy. And this is going to push demand through the roof. Now, of course, there are going to be problems. People worry about inflation. And the reason people worry about inflation is the economy, because it was put to sleep, is a wee bit like us getting up in the morning now. It's yawning. It's a little bit knackered. It's like, oh, Jesus, I have to get up, right? It's going to take a while for the economy to get back to its vigorous post a pre-pandemic self. So the inflation, I believe, is quite transitory, okay? And that will eventually shake that off. So we have in the short term, what we call in economics, the cyclical short term, we have an economy that's going to go through the roof. Not here, but all over the world. No shortage of money, no shortage of enthusiasm, no shortage of companies, and away we go. And then you think, okay, that's good. We like the sound of that. Structurally, Structurally, what has happened? How has the pandemic affected us as uh, people and the way we work and the way we do business? It's very clear to me, by the way, I've been working from home for many years. If you work for yourself for 20 years, I feel I'm slightly at an advanced party and you'll all get used to it. But it's very clear that the office, the nine to five office is over. It's going to be something different. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it's not going to be schlepping in and out being at one's desk at a certain time. The commute, such as it was, again, will look very, very primitive, not only in terms of the way in which technology, which we're going to talk about, is going to change the world, but actually 
against the background of climate change, being stuck in a car in traffic looks really bad. It's going to be a bad look, OK? What about the way in which we live and work? It's quite clear to me that commercial property, well, maybe I shouldn't mention this right now, looks like a very bad bet. So what we have is the big picture, the opportunity for this country to be an energy exporter is phenomenal, OK? And the money is there. The where we are now is the economy itself will surge forward, but structurally we're going to change the way we live, work and play, which is good. And then you think, OK, are there any lessons we can get from the past? Is there any lesson from the past that might give us a sort of a blueprint as to where 2020s and the 2030s will go? You know, has there been a previous pandemic that shut everything down? that people were traumatized by, and why did we, how did we react to it? And of course there is, it's the, uh, what they called them, the Spanish flu. The, the fascinating thing with the Spanish flu is it wasn't Spanish at all. It actually came from Arkansas. Anybody who knows about American football will know that the college team from Arkansas are called the Hogs. And the reason they're called the Hogs is Arkansas is a pig rearing state. And the Spanish flu was actually a swine flu that came from Arkansas. And when the soldiers, the farming workers, were conscripted into the American army in 1917, they were already infected. And they brought the flu to Europe via American military and Navy ships. And they infected the French, German and British troops. And of course, the French, German and British were at war. So the last thing they wanted to do was tell their people that their soldiers had been killed by a flu and not the enemy. So they didn't report on it. And because the poor old Spaniards were the only large country that was actually neutral, the Spaniards reported on it and it became the Spanish flu. So if you name it, you own it very clearly, right? But what actually happened after that? At the time, economists and civil servants were saying, I'm not sure. I think the economy is going to be traumatized after this. What came after it was what they called the Roaring Twenties. And the Roaring Twenties was this extraordinary period of innovation, extraordinary period of economic adventurism. Imagine the 1920s, you get electricity. The 1920s, you get the motor car. The 1920s, you get the radio. These are amazing technologies all coming together after a pandemic and the American economy in particular soars ahead. Now, I happen to think that the same level of innovation is on the horizon for us, okay? Both in business and in science. But you also think what else happened in the 1920s after that pandemic? You have 100 years ago next year, the publication of Ulysses. So James Joyce, maybe, maybe the cleverest person ever born in this country, publishes a book which basically reinvents the novel. Picasso is in his blue face in the 1920s. Einstein gets the Nobel Prize in the 1920s. Freud has seeded all sorts of Freudian psychoanalytic clinics in every major city. What you get is a massive increase in brain power, in intellectualism, in culture and in economics after the trauma of a pandemic. And I happen to think that we are on the cusp of something broadly similar for the next 10 or 15 years. And sometimes in economics is a feel. Economists will never talk about things like feelings because we're meant to be all scientific. But sometimes if you catch the public mood, there is a feel. And my sense is that you take the way the economy is working now, you take the structural changes, you take this total shift in the way in which we're thinking about money, okay? So money is no longer the constraint it used to be irrespective of what the Department of Finance here are saying, okay? And what you get is the launch pad for something quite, 
quite phenomenal. And then you think, okay, where's Ireland's game plan? Ireland's game plan has to be in this extraordinary prize, which is becoming the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. I don't think there's ever been an open goal like this for a country. That, that thing that we complained about all our lives, the miserable summers and the shocking winters and the fact that the West, well, I don't know about you, but I used to have to go to Ackle on my holidays when I was a kid. I never saw it. I'd go, where are we? You know, the rain would be coming in sideways, that whole thing. In Carrow and the Gale talked as a kid, you know, confused in two languages, not only one language, right? Okay, but therein is a gift from the environmental gods, which is this combination of the Gulf Stream and the Atlantic. Okay, being the only rock between here and Canada is enormously advantageous when you're trying to capture that energy. So we in this country should be very optimistic about what I believe is going to be quite a transformative next 30 years. Now, interestingly, the last 30 years, for those in the room old enough to remember, and I am one of them, this country in 1991, if you ever see photographs, it looks like not just a different century, a different millennium, which it was, but a totally different planet. And in the last 30 years, this country has done a lot of things wrong, but we've done a hell of a lot of things right. And we've come a long way. I think that we can look forward to the next 30 years with a similar level of confidence if we simply have the energy and the chutzpah to seize the opportunity that is presented. Because if the world's financial players are going to put together such a huge amount of money to get to net zero, it can only be enormously beneficial to those countries that have the natural renewable energy in their environment, which we are one. So I will open this morning with a positive and optimistic view of the way in which our country, I think, is going to head. And also, therefore, for your own businesses, the background noise, which I think is going to be unbelievably positive in terms of where we've come. Now, you don't always get effusive economists early doors, and it's not just because we're all out for our first real gig. Is this your first gig? More or less, isn't it? It's quite good. Do you know what's really nice? I know I'm talking to this camera, but it's lovely not to be sitting at home worried about your bookshelf. <laughs> I'm worried about, you know, the state of the children. I'm worried about the state of the kitchen and looking into that little green thing saying, are we on air now? Are we all right when I talk now? So it is lovely to be back. I know we're in a small group, but soon we'll be in much, much bigger groups. I think, any, any medics in the place that can tell me? I don't know, soon, soonish, soonish. Uh, I'm all for the second and third booster. I'm lining up for the whole lot of them. So I think it's going to be a wonderfully dynamic economy into which this new product, this new merger is launching. I think we should be very confident about where we are going. Clearly, there are some problems. I won't mention them because they're probably going to come out in the panel discussion. There's political problems, there's issues with housing, there's all these things we, we know are difficult, but they can all be fixed. But what is fascinating is that the underlying effervescence is as positive as any time I've experienced. So let us open today's discussion with enthusiasm, with optimism, with realism, but I think with a certain amount of confidence. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to talk to the man behind the whole gig, Martin Wells, the Managing Director of Air Business, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, Martin, I'm sitting, I'm, we're doing our best Westlife. Am I still? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. telling I, you. I got it still. <laughs> well, I saw that Westlife are actually, we have, they've reformed. And I was thinking, looking, if we could be like a middle-aged redhead version of we Westlife. Could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We need some backing singers, I think. We yeah. need some backing singers. I, I was supposed to have a chair, but I'll stand. I'll stand. <laughs> Tell me, 
Big day. Big, huge day, yeah. But I mean, it's interesting what you were saying. I mean, I think we'd really share your optimism about the economy. I mean, business in Ireland, I think, is resilient. It bounces back from things. And I, I think a large part of what made this, this deal happen in the merger come was optimism. It was looking at the economy, it was looking at Irish business and just thinking, you know, there's going to be a lot of things going on and you want to be at the centre of it. You know, so it's, it's interesting that's what you were speaking about this morning because I really think that's the, the core of what we were, what yeah, we were no, trying no, to do. It's true. Now, of course, you know, there was, was a Bismarck used to talk about politics and he always said, somebody said, what's politics like? And he says, it's like sausage making. You eat the sausage if you like them, but don't just see how the whole thing's put together, right? <laughs> the riddle pleasant, right? Yeah, yeah. I presume a merger's a wee bit like that. It was. Well, if I go back to the start of it, the kind of idea behind it, I mean, there was a real strategy in air, as I say, to, about optimism and really trying to grow the business and get into new areas and so on. Um, so when we were looking at that specifically from a business perspective, the, the real driver behind this was customers. So what we were finding is air was traditionally strong in areas of kind of telecoms, so voice, data, building networks, all of those kind of things, things our customers would expect from us. And we're good at that. Do you know, we had a lot of long-standing customers. But more and more we were finding there was a real transition happening in this kind of idea of digital transformation. So more and more customers were looking to kind of move to the cloud, they were looking for managed services, which is really taking on their infrastructure and networks and managing that on their behalf. Cyber security was becoming a big thing. So Air was in a position that to do that had to partner, right? And that's not always an ideal thing because, you know, it gets more complicated and so on. So really what it was, was it was a portfolio thing. We were looking at this and saying we really had to think about how we could rebalance our portfolio. So there's two ways to do that. It's either a kind of buy or a build strategy, and that's that's what we had to think through. So it would take a long time to, to build all of these, right? And there's people out there that do this very well. So we had to go and see who was in the market. It didn't take as long to find Evros, I have to say, right? Really? It like, and it was, it was interesting. Like, almost like, yeah. It was very quick. It was like at the slow set years ago. It was like that, yeah. We were kind of yeah. gazing across the room with them for a while, yeah. two registers, we didn't do well in the slow sets. <laughs> I did fine, I don't know. I, yeah. really, no, I, I developed a great pattern. I did, did, did you not develop a great pattern as a red zone? It's a Scottish accent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, yeah okay, so you're at the slow set. Tell so me. we were doing that, and then what happened was somebody just said to me this morning, it's actually 16 months since the very first meeting we have where we kind of crept into the building here and um, 16 months to, to this day, which is amazing that we managed to do that. But it was a, I mean, it was actually a very nice courtship, I have to say, because I think both organisations very quickly kind of came to the belief that it was very complimentary. Do you know, I think the kind of vision that we shared was, was a shared vision and you know, we could really see the opportunities and the upside of this. So even during COVID, it was, we got to a point very quickly. I think, I think it was less than six months that we actually got the whole kind of That's courtship done. That is done. kind of extraordinary. Yeah. And it was actually the morning of Christmas Eve we signed the we signed the, the deal. So then we had another couple of months for clearance and we actually came out in March of this year. But uh, I mean, it was a really, really good process, I have to say, that they got us there. And one I, th I think we're all still very, very optimistic about in, in the future and so on. So that was the kind of courtship of it. Can I turn on his head and ask you about the customer, right? What can the customer, so you, you guys have figured it out and whatever, but what can the, can the customer, let's say, an SME or even an MME, yeah. right? Or a BME, right? Yeah. Uh, how can they expect? Well, see, I think what we've done here, and we think this is the first in Ireland, that what we've done is created a kind of one-stop shop, right? Because now we've, we've got the balance in the portfolio and the, the, the organisation we deal with. I mean, we deal with all the kind of major vendors. And what they bring is fantastic innovation, right? So it's not necessarily that we have to bring it. We do. But working with these people, you know, they're always driving things on. And technology drives itself on. So having that portfolio is an amazing thing, right? The other thing that, that's really impressed me in both organisations is just the expertise. You know, the level of talent and the, the level of kind of like qualifications and learning and just yeah. experience that's in both organisations is amazing. So, you know, when companies want to undergo this, whether they're large or small, you know, if they want to undergo these big transformation programmes, they really want to be working with organisations that bring the best in technology, but they also have people that are experienced at doing this and they're familiar. Can I ask you something on a personal case? Because I always think sometimes if it's just like anything, if, if something is shaken up, right? Talents emerge from people you never expected. Mm. Did that emerge? Is that like something that's when you put with your management hat on? Did, were there people who you thought, wow, I didn't know that she had that going on? Or, you know, because you know, when, you're, when you're in a company you're, and you're in a role, yeah. and you're doing the role every day and the, the role is demanding a certain amount from you, but there's always an extra bit that you have. Mm. That somebody hasn't really tapped on the shoulder and says, yeah, I'd like to see that. I think, did you, did you see that? Because you were talking about the people and the... Yeah, you, I think if you see innovation all across. Then, I mean, to me, innovation is not necessarily one big thing. 
right? I think you see it in people and you see it in ideas and you see it in a kind of passion. You see them really kind of getting, you know, really wanting to do things and move things on. What really impressed me about Ebros, I have to say, and, you know, this, well, there's a lot of kind of similarities. There are some differences in the two organisations, right? One of the things that really struck me about Ebros, two things, right? But the first thing is see that innovation, I would say almost DNA or gene, like that will to always be looking ahead because there's a kind of, you know, medium sized business growing. They had to. Yeah. You know, they had to have an edge and they had to have something that they could bring to the table. But that innovation was incredible. And you felt it right through the organisation. You know, they'd make bags and new technology. You know, they'd stand up teams. They'd engage customers with it. So it's, it's a real DNA thing for them. The other thing I think that they have in abundance is what I would call kind of customer focus, like a real desire to kind of work with the customers and build long-standing relationships and things like that. So you know, Air bring a lot of scale. We bring a lot of kind of tradition and heritage and things sure. like that. You know, these guys are super in innovation, super in customer service, and you balance the portfolio. You know, that's a lot to bring to the table, I think, right? No, so, it is a huge amount. And, and, and as, you, as you said, like one, one is a bigger beast, a more established player, and therefore maybe didn't have to be that innovative for quite some possibly, time because yeah, you're the only player in the, in, in, on the field. You know? And it's funny you talk about innovation. I was reading about Gutenberg last night. He's fascinating me now, right? And Gutenberg's great, one of his great uh, insights uh, wasn't the printing bit of the printing press, but it was the press bit of the printing press. And Gutenberg used to be a wine merchant, right? He was a great man for Gardner, yeah. right? <laughs> and he loved his wine because he lived in that part of Germany that produced lots of wine around the Mosul. And printers could figure out how to put the metal printers, they, all that they'd figured out, right? But they couldn't figure out how do you press this thing down so that it's actually the same level of pressure across the page so the print doesn't smudge, which is important for printers. And Gutenberg's sitting there and he's having a few glasses of gargle, talking to a friend of his, and the guy says, listen, why don't you come? We've got this new, we've got this new batch. We've got this really good wine. Come on up. And he goes into, and he figures out the wine press, you know, the corks yeah, 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 yeah. That's the that's key, the answer, yeah. right? That's the key. And the interesting thing about innovation is putting things together which you never thought of before. And do you see that now? You're seeing things, that, stuff that you had. You thought, oh, yeah, you yeah. I mean, getting the two teams together is fantastic. I mean, and that's one of the things that we think is going to make a huge difference, right? Because when you start to blend the teams, you know, you, they're working on one kind of aspect of things with a customer. You introduce different people and, you know, it just mixes it up a bit, right? And then that creativity just kind of spawns from itself. So, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the whole kind of integration has been a really, really important thing. I mean, the, the way we kind of try to approach it, because as I say, last March, we kind of popped out of this, right? But these two kind of constituent groups, I think, when you bring organisations together, you've got to be conscious of, right? One is your people, right? And what you've got to do is kind of bring them with a the vision and where it is you want to go and their role in it. And, you know, just make sure they share the excitement of what it is that you're trying to do. But probably the most important is the customer, right? Because in some ways, well, you know, you want to innovate and you want to change things. There's a lot to be said for stability <laughs> with certain things, right? Yes. And what customers don't want to see is kind of rash moves or big changes yeah. or things like that, right? You want to take them on a journey as well. So we've been very thoughtful about the integration up to now. And I think today in the brand and just the kind of the, 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 the launch of the new brand is probably the first major milestone that we've really seen, you know, and it's about the two organisations now coming together as one. It's about the future, you know, and it's about all the great things that we think we're going to be able to do together. No, it's interesting you say that because sometimes I, you know, when you see those evangelical technology heads uh, saying, running around saying, you know, move quickly and break yeah. things. <laughs> I think, uh, no, yeah. don't break no, things. No, sometimes, Some things yeah, sometimes, broken. yeah, you've got to be a bit more thoughtful, yeah, yeah. So just give us a, give us a flavour of the future. I mean, you know, we're talking about hundreds of people who are viewing from home, right? Mm. Customers, employees, potential customers. Yeah. Okay, what can they expect? Well, I, th I think that they've got, they're going to get a lot of what they're used to, right, which is great customer service, a great range of products, I think, and, and people that really, you know, know what they're doing and work hard. With their businesses so that that portfolio thing is good we're looking to grow the business right so i mean at the moment we're looking to hire 40 or 50 new people so we see a huge amount of demand in, in the area of cloud services everything we're doing there cyber security is a big area but across all the disciplines but those ones in particular so it's going to be a bigger growing organization a big part of the brand and what we, we try to achieve because you know, like changing a brand is, 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 you know, it's not a thing that you do lightly, no. right? Well, no, and we have two, two strong two, brands. Two good brands. Yeah, 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 two very good brands coming to the table. But what you're trying to do is take the best from both worlds. 
you know, so I suppose on their side, it's that kind of tradition, that heritage and that, that scale. I think on the Evros side, it's that customer centricity and the innovation. So the idea of, of Air Evo and the, the, you know, the, the, the evolution of the new brand, it's, it's all about that evolve, you know, kind of evolve your business, revolution, change, that type of thing. But we really want to dial up innovation. You know, that's something that we want to kind of keep in the, the DNA of this new yeah. organisation. So just simple things, like if you think of COVID um, and the return to work, I mean, the guys here developed this Office Pass app, which has just been really, really successful, right? And it's just born out of a small group of people in here and just, what is it? It's just an app basically that helps you just bring your workforce back to the workplace safely. So you can measure where they're at, who's at the desks, you can register them in. It also has a, a, a kind of an aspect of it, you can check CO2 and the travel it's bringing. So, you know, you can work on the yeah. green agenda, but it's such brilliant innovation. And you can just see more and more companies taking it up. But that's just a small thing and it's just an example. But if you have that DNA in the company, and that kind of, you know, people know that these ideas will be listened to and they'll be brought forward. It's a really exciting thing. So, I mean, a big thing we want to try and dial up with, with Air Evo is that thing. We bring the scale, you know, we bring the experience and all that, but we want to be about innovation as well. And we want to kind of show that and, and that's it. So those are the kind of things I think customers can, they can expect from us. I think having discussed the brand and having talked about the brand, uh, I think let's have a look, let's have a look at, at the all. new brand. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's have a go at the new brand. Then. Okay. We're going to get a vote. We go. Uh, think about what's possible. Uh, <laughs> you know how long I've been waiting for that? I tell you now, no, I think for, for all involved, for Martin and all the team that put together integrating two big businesses, you know, I think, again, big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Ever think about what's possible in the future? There's a new day coming. Air Business and Evros Technology Group have come together to form Air Evo, Ireland's number one telecommunications and ICT solutions provider, and the first of its kind to redefine what's possible now. For the first time in Ireland, you can elevate your business with true end-to-end -end solutions from one partner delivered with innovation, expertise, and a unique connection between technology and people. Air Evo opens up a new world of ways for you to benefit from the latest technologies so that you can innovate, evolve, and grow your business well into the future, starting from today. Air Evo, together we make possible. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Air Evo, and for yourselves at home, this is a new brand, which I think we're going to see quite, I, be, I believe you sponsored an amazing podcast. We did, really David. That's funny good. you should say that. It's I, funny you should say that. The best a, in the country. It's a particularly, you know, it, it shows great foresight. It shows <laughs> great, vision, great taste, yeah. great vision, back in the right players, the whole thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Anyway, we'll hold it there. We'll be back in a second. Big, big round for Martin Wells, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And now I want to introduce somebody who doesn't need any introduction because COVID and the last 24 months, let's say, has propelled people into the public eye. I don't think like any other public event in Ireland. And one of those people is Paul Reid, who you'll know as the Director General of the HSE. And Paul is now, as a customer, and as an expectant new customer, going to talk to us about what this company, this merger, will mean for his company, the HSE. So, Paul Reid, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and good morning. And firstly, my apologies that I can't be there with you in person this morning. Uh, but I am really pleased and privileged to have the opportunity to say a few words at a very exciting event this morning uh, for Air Evo as the new brand a new business, new enterprise, new merger is launched. First of all, I know there are many of you in attendance and I do hope that you're all following the public health guidelines with plenty of social distancing uh, and mask wearing uh, because it's really important at uh, this point in time. I half jest, but it is a very difficult period that we're in at the moment with very significant impacts of COVID, rising cases, increasing positivity and hospitalizations. 
So there is an onus on us all once again, and I know many of you are probably sick of hearing me saying this message, uh, but it is a very big time for individual respons responsibility and equally for our business and enterprise as more and more people are back at work to put those levels of protection in place relentlessly. And when we do all that, we will turn this current phase around once again. I said it's quite a privilege to be able to talk this morning, and it truly is because I have spent a very significant proportion of my own career uh, with AIR, although at the time it was a combination of the Department of Post and Telegraphs, uh, Telecom Aaron, and indeed Aircom. Uh, 28 years uh, of my career, which was a tremendous time, a fabulous learning experience, and gained, gained great expertise, and not just in terms of networks, which I was responsible for, but just ultimately managing in a big organization. And I'm truly grateful for the fantastic time and many friends I've made over the years with such a great organization. And I do know in that period in time, um, you know, I started at the, um, many people said he started at the bottom or at the uh, ground level of an organization. I actually started on the ground as a trainee installer uh, at the time with the Department of P&T, but did grow my career throughout the organization uh, and did spend the last 10 years of my career running the networks organization. So a very good understanding of networks and technology and business enterprise solutions and where it fits in the whole ICT environment and providing solutions for customers. I equally conscious as my current role as CEO of the HSE, what we have been through and what the public have been through in the past 18, 20 months now of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm particularly aware uh, and understanding of the rapid solutions that we had to put in place over a very short period of time to protect the public throughout COVID. And certainly at the very early stages of that, we knew that we had to work with many of our enterprise ICT and network partners. I'm very pleased that they're being one of those very key partners who've worked with us throughout that period to put in solutions to protect the public. And one of my experiences throughout all of that was in particular how sometimes we keep focused on the big strategic network ICT solutions for business and for customers. And they are important. But my experience over the past 20 months were some of the tactical solutions that we put in place gave us the greatest benefit of protection uh, for the public and for our patients. And I could just relay some of them in simple terms. We had to very quickly create a connectivity between many of the HSE systems and other health practitioners like GPs and pharmacies. And uh, we had to connect our systems in such a manner that at the very early stages, as the public came through to GPs for their healthcare or for testing for COVID, uh, that they could be referred in a very simple way um, from the GPs for testing. And indeed, to get their results in a simple way through technology, and indeed for us to be able to contact trace people in a very simple way. So they sound like very simple ICT and network solutions, but they were very effective for us. And they were one of the ways in which the public got a lot of trust and confidence uh, from the HSE because we were able to put in very quick solutions through our network and ICT environments. Equally, I just want to make reference to the vaccination program that we've been engaged in, which is as of today, once again, recognized by Bloomberg as the most effective vaccination program across the world. And again, we don't take that lightly. There are a couple of reasons why that has happened. Firstly, again, the role that networks and technology solutions put in place for us to be able to facilitate the public to be able to register for their vaccine, be called for the vaccine, being given a second date for the second vaccine, uh, and for them to get all of the relevant information to support them in getting that uh, was a really important network solution that we had to put in place in a very short time frame through our strategic partners. And I reference that because that equally is what gave the public such good trust and confidence in the vaccination program. And one of the reasons that we have the highest uptake, one of the highest uptakes in the world of our vaccination program is because people got strengthened trust and confidence uh, from our public messaging, but equally from the experience of everybody 
coming through for vaccination in a very safe way. So I use those two examples to demonstrate how we have seen the role of technology enterprise and solutions, and sometimes simple integrated network solutions can provide huge benefits to all of the people, the customers, and in our case, the patients and the public that we serve. And it has been a third benefit for us, which has been the utilization of effective data, which I know is very important uh, for the new uh, marriage business of Air Evo. Because using data from both the vaccination program and the testing and tracing program is helping us to give greater insights into areas A, where we may have a lower uptake on the vaccination program, correlating that against where we are seeing highest case numbers, and able to help us focus our communications into those remaining smaller elements of the population that need to come forward for vaccination. So I say all of that just to give you my brief insights into how technology, networks, ICT solutions have a very played a very big role throughout this pandemic. And I do want to take the opportunity to wish Air Evo and the new brand and the new merger uh, all the very best in terms of how you uh, keep focused on that role that technology, that ICT uh, can play and can continue to play for enterprise in the next phase uh, of this pandemic, but also in the next phase of uh, COVID and how we're living with COVID. And I would also stress the benefit and the opportunity that we are seeing, and I know you as expert providers of networks will see, uh, the opportunities for enterprise solutions now for a whole new way of working, a whole new way of people will come to work or engage at work or collaborate at work or collaborate with the organization uh, from remote locations. And we know the world of work is going to be different, but we equally know the world of the people and the customers that we serve, and in our case, the patients and the public is going to be very different. So I do see it as a huge opportunity uh, for the new organization, for the new brand that you're launching today. Uh, and I know from a health service perspective, we are very focused now on the role that eHealth and eTechnology can provide in many new ways. I've said it very recently, uh, I have in all my career never seen so much change implemented in such a short space and time by so many people with such benefit uh, for the public as I've seen across the public service over the past 18, 20 months. So I do know for the benefits for your own organization for the future, it's not just the health service who see this opportunity. It is indeed the whole of the public service that has learned great insights into the better use of technology for the future provision of services to the public. So that's going to remain a very strong team uh, of my leadership uh, in the HSC that we do embrace the opportunities uh, for technology network networks and ITC solution, ICT solutions. Finally, I know many of my ex-colleagues and friends are there today. I uh, want to wish Carla Ann Lennon the very best, the CEO, continued success. Uh, I do want to wish Dave McRedmond, the chairman of uh, AIR, who's there today, I'm sure, uh, the very best also. Uh, one of my colleagues now across the public service uh, and agencies that we're both running. And I also want to wish the very best of luck to Martin Wells, uh, the MD, uh, who will be leading and responsible for the whole Networks ICT provision of new solutions. And the very best to everybody who's been involved in the merger uh, and the new recruitment campaign that you're all getting on. It's good for business, it's good for enterprise, it's good for Ireland, and I know it can be good for the public service too. Thank you and all the very best today. Paul Reed, there, ladies and gentlemen, person who's done an amazing job in a very difficult, very, very difficult time. Now we're going to expand it out. We are joined by four, well, we have one expert, three new experts uh, on the panel. I have Carolyn Lennon behind me, who's, as Paul said, is the new appointee or CEO of AIR appointed. In February, was February 2012, 2018, yeah, isn't new. It's just my, yeah. my brain works. Not that new, not that new. So, Caroline Lennon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> David McRegmond on post. David McRegmond was appointed Chief Executive Officer of, on post in October 2016. David McRegmond, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and Fiona Taff, Chief Information Officer at Dubai Aerospace Enterprise. Fiona, you're very welcome. 
we decided before that everyone had this huge CV that almost had like your leave insert results in it, or your repeating leave insert results in it. We decided we just go straight to the new title, of course, uh, Martin's with us. Caroline, can I ask you, we're talking about, I kind of opened up talking about Ireland, where we are, etc., where the economy is. Business-wise, how do you think the business world has changed? since the pandemic and what do you expect in the next you know wee while as we all come back out to play yeah so like you I, and, and martin I, I shared the optimism in terms of i think there is there are huge opportunities out there and you know COVID has taught us that as a country and businesses we all have the capability to innovate and you know we're doing things now that we never thought we'd be able to do in terms of what you know so so I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that and there's also a lot of money sloshing around i'm also on the board of aib and i see how the savings levels have increased or whatever yeah. so I, I think there is a huge opportunity there i'm a bit more worried than you are about inflation i think it, it may be it may be longer but i'm also worried about people and and kind of staff so we're like we are struggling at the moment to fill roles uh, the availability and I'm, I'm hearing this from my other colleagues across business so it's harder to hire people i think you wrote about it recently people yeah. leaning out of, of work a bit it's, it is harder to hire now than it was and also there is a scarcity in some of those that's... ict sort of skills or whatever that we're seeing out there so i suppose that's something that i'd be you know i suppose tactically worried yeah. about as, as a ceo of, of a big company like this and needing oh we're always hiring always recruiting trying to bring in new talent and you know and grow the talent we have so that's Probably one of the things that I, you know, I think post pandemic is something that is of concern. And it's interesting because I know the Americans refer to this thing called what they call the Great Resignation. So 20 million Americans have actually jacked in their jobs and not looked for another one in the last five months, which is a big, big change. And they're probably thinking to themselves, well, look, the market is buoyant. Uh, so do you think? I mean, is it because maybe we lost maybe a lot of Central European? uh migrants went home and haven't come back yet is the do you think it's a transitory thing or do you think we've got a, a problem with hiring now because this, this would be quite new yeah so i'm, I'm hoping it's transitory. it would certainly we've lost people from the workforce there's no yeah. doubt yeah and um but there's also lots of opportunities out there and you don't necessarily have to you know um take a job in dublin if you live in dublin yeah. you know yeah. so i think that's kind of changed the way people are working and thinking about opportunities but I also think people have kind of reevaluated as well in terms of, you know, work-life balance, how much they want on their plate, how hard they want to work, you know. And again, you know, most people were, you know, running fast to kind of stay still. Suddenly you got, you know, nearly two years, as you say, to step back and say, you know, is this for me? Yeah. So I think we've got all those things kind of coming together. And I'm hoping as, you know, people start to go back into the office, because like, I was very optimistic in the early days of COVID about working from home and it worked out really well and we did things at home that I never thought we could do and like again you know you know acquiring a business during America I didn't think we yeah, could do those a, things. That's a big deal. However I do feel in the last you know the last maybe four to six months you see that energy starting to lag a little bit and I think it is important that people do you know get back and spend some time together to kind of re-energize each other get that innovation going or whatever so you know I think that that is important yeah. and maybe when that happens people will go, actually, you know, that, that wasn't so bad being in the yeah. office working with my colleagues. Maybe I'd kind of like to do that again. So I, I think at the moment, it's kind of a, a little bit of a quandary. You know, we're not fully back. Uh, people are reevaluating, And we definitely have lost workers, there's no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David, I see you nodding your head uh, in agreement there. about this. I would like to get this sense from yourselves as chief executives of big employers and sort of brands that Irish people just know and that's and, and, and I've been around for a long time are you feeling the same the same tightness in the labor market are you feeling people are saying well you know what I had quite a nice time the last 18 months I might not necessarily go back just yet is that what absolutely uh, look there's uh, these are extraordinary times there's an there's an anxiety there's uh, there's a little bit of PTSD um, uh, societally um, and and I think we're going to have the those shock after waves probably for the next year, I would say. Certainly, I think until you get out in business terms out of the comps from COVID, which really is if the last lockdown ended in May uh, of this year, you're yeah. going to have to get through that period. Then businesses can start to look normal again. You know, in Unpust, it's extraordinary. You know, when your, your, your volumes go By the way, up. You've, you've had a great lockdown. Uh, our volumes. How was up. your lockdown? I'm going to ask our lockdown. How was your lockdown? Uh, right. You know, our, our parcel volumes went up 100%, and now they're coming down very sharply, 25%, and then they start going up again. 
businesses aren't used to those sorts of swings. Yeah. You know, and when you're in a very physical business like um, like Compost, you know, one day you can't fit the stuff into the van, the next day you plenty of rubber. You know, it's it's extraordinary. And this is this is world trade and what's happening with world trade. And we're in we're in a period we've big ads out at the moment in the press saying the world's just got more complicated. Uh, the world's more complicated because there are trade wars, there are differences. Um, and yet society isn't back functioning yeah. to any level of normality. I, I mean, the optimism is so important and never is it going to be more important for businesses playing their role, whether it be Air Revo, whether it be Air, whether it be Impus, to actually lead with, uh, with, with optimism. Um, because we will get through this. We know we will get through the next nine months, the next 12 yeah. months. And we know when we get there, all of the opportunities which you talked about earlier this morning um, around what we can do in this country, they are fantastic opportunities. The people who are in the great resignation will eventually start running out of the savings and will decide, sure. well, maybe I will come back. And you know what, if people take an extended break of a year, well, maybe great, maybe good luck, and, and, and maybe that's a wonderful thing to do. The rebalancing of life and, and work, of course, has to happen. I like a bit more work in that rebalancing. Um, those things have to happen. So, so look, it's a time when we're going to be reforming and reshaping. Um, but, but ultimately, I think we should be excited, knowing, though, that we've got a really tough six, nine months ahead of us, I think. Okay, that's interesting. So you think we're, we're in this weird period, because it is kind of weird, because the signals are very odd. And you, as you say, things are gyrating up and down at levels you never saw before. But this is this is the idea that you hear that, you know, people talk about if you haven't brushed your teeth for quite some time, okay, which is oh, clearly not me, but you know, the, you ever know, the, the toothpaste coagulates around the top of the thing? Right? And that's what happens after a lockdown, right? So the whole economy is a little bit sort of coagulated, it's calcified, and you're pushing to try and get the same level of service. So it does come out spewing a kind of a bit of inflation here. But I mean, I happen to think that the way the economy works will come back to something, maybe not to normal, but to something very different sooner than we think. That's that's my that's my hope. Fiona, I've always thought in the aerospace industry, did you ever think that oh, maybe you should have got into something different in the last <laughs> the last 15 months it's like you know particularly somewhere like dubai which is such a hub of activity by the way i was there a couple of weeks ago i got out for the first time to do a gig it was fab it's nothing better it's than being in the plane a couple of weeks ago oh my god the world is normal again yeah look um in the last 15 months we were no different to everybody else but would i want to have been in a different industry in the last 15 months no from an IT standpoint, absolutely not. <laughs> We've driven agendas that we wouldn't have got done as quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, there's really a lot of positives out of COVID for companies. Um, yeah, there was a different operating model because you went from leasing airplanes to restructuring contracts and people got really, really innovative in terms of, at the end of the day, you have an airplane. There's no point in taking it back because who are you going to lease it onto? You want these customers to survive because that is the future. So it was really about looking at where's the, the yin and the yang in, in terms of restructuring contracts so that you keep airlines alive and yet be able to finance the aircraft that you have because behind every aircraft is a gorgeous mortgage, <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> There's a lovely large financing to be, to be serviced. But um, I would be more optimistic maybe in terms of talent, in terms of, and I think we shouldn't blame lockdown and the pandemic on every A campaign that we have. I think some of the talent shortages that we're seeing are a correction. Um, there might have been some lethargy at board levels and at sea levels in terms of certain industries um, when it came to investment in IT and things like that. And that has thrown the investment in IT and the dependency in IT, that awakening has caused a shortage of talent because now everybody wants the resources and they're not there because we're not working it back down into our education cycles. People are going to like, look at the fallout rates in universities of, of IT um, students. It's absolutely massive in the first year and very, you know, even very large percentages never finish their degrees. So how do you correct that? How do you make that technology as a choice of career that people don't get, that, that they're not turned off and kind yeah. of, I've got three kids, none of them want to touch IT, <laughs> right? Because they see it as techie techie. 
we need to change the mindset. We need to say, look, this is part and parcel. You've got a phone in your hand. How do you think it works? Um, so I think the talent shortages are different maybe to the aches and pains that we're seeing as a result of pandemic. That's interesting, um, Martin, yeah? You know, I think it's harder to get people. I, do, I, I kind of agree entirely with what people are saying, but that's why the brand is important. You have to bring something as an employer. Yeah. Do you know, so I mean, this thing today in creating this brand, we hope that's going to stand for something. So you'll attract these type of people because they are a scarce resource, albeit a, a correction or whatever. Um, and then you've got to create an environment with them that they think they can build a career and, you know, that. So, you know, you've got to work a bit harder. I think, Harry, yes. you know, to, to do that's it. It's not a bad but, thing. It's not a bad thing. No, 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 no. You know, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's it's like if the if the end result of the pandemic and all the various associated changes is that employers and employees have to sit down and maybe renegotiate the contract, renegotiate the status quo. That's not a bad thing. You know, it's not a bad thing at all. Can I ask you about, sometimes this is regarded as a buzzword, but I think it's real kind of corporate responsibility, corporate sustainability, you know, the, the ESG is the, 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 the governance, the environment, talk, we ticked off the environment, the social obligations. How do you think large companies are going to have to position themselves with respect to society in the next couple of years? Are we going to think about that differently? Well, I think we've certainly, you know, in, in air and as a CEO, you know, we've been thinking about that for 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 a long time, and uh, and we've you know we're one of the 40 Irish companies that has you know the an ISO accreditation for business in the community because we wanted someone else to come in and you know it's all right for me to say I think we're doing the right things, but it's much you know more important that someone else yes, externally comes yes. in and tells us. So I think you know it's it's hard for me to think of a business where that wasn't on the agenda. But do I think it's going to be more on the agenda and more measurement required? And more demands, it'll be as important to have your sustainability report as to have your annual report, as far as I'm concerned, going forward. We're I going do. To get and there quite and I think there's going to be standards. So it's not going to be just, well, there's Karen Ann's report, there's David's report. I think we're going to have those, you know, those standards to say so that we can look at each other and measure like for like or whatever. So um, you know, so of course it's across the whole thing, you know, environment, society and governance. But I mean, I think Climate is now, I mean, I do believe that the time for action on the climate crisis is absolutely now. We are running out of time. So I think that is where, you know, the effort is going to be required. And I think we all have to kind of take responsibility there. I mean, you know, if we you know, we do all the things you'd expect us to do. We buy green electricity, we've upgraded our fleet, we're getting rid of paper, we do all that sort of stuff. But the reality is 75% of our emissions come from our networks. Uh, the electricity that's required yep. to, to run those networks. So at one, st at one level, we're expanding the mobile network by you know 25%, we're rolling fibre out, which has great societal benefits and actually environmental benefits in terms of you know, fibre is much more energy efficient than copper is. Uh, you know, people being able to work from home means they don't commute, but we have to balance that yep. out. So the, the upgrade of the network um, should lead to less um, you know, energy required in the future, but the expansion of the network, so how do we balance all of those? But we're going to have to get, air's going to have to get uh, to net zero, and we're going to have to find ways to do that you know, over the yeah, coming years. Which and are not that obvious straight away. Uh, yeah, they're not that obvious straight away. Now, I, I do believe in you know, man's ability to innovate and solve problems. We've seen it all across the world. We've seen it with vaccines, we've seen it with everything. So I'm sure you know, we've got some of our you know, our network manufacturing suppliers in the in the room and, you know, they're manufacturing better kit that is more energy efficient all the time. So I think it will come, but we have to absolutely get behind it. You know, and if you're in any position where you can influence some of that stuff, you've got to do it now because we're we're absolutely yeah. running out of time as far as I'm concerned. No, I think there were, yeah, anybody else on, on, on the ESG and sustainability yeah. and corporate it's, it's, responsibility? It's unquestionable, David. I mean, it's, it's, we're well beyond the stage of, I think what, what you or your colleagues would call late capitalism of, of you know, the excessive drive for profits, the yeah. um, excessive focus, I would say, in profits. Um, the world has changed so dramatically, and it was happening before the pandemic. This is not to do with COVID. Um, the acknowledgement of climate action is so important, but for us, you know, and plus sustainability is about more than that. It's about, it's about decent work, decent jobs. One of the great things about air is it provides really decent employment and decent standards, yep. and so does on post. And, and you know, these things are missed in, in a world which is moving towards gig economy and things like that. So, so it's absolutely vital we look at sustainability in the round. 
on the specifics as well, though it's about making big moves. Um, slightly different to air and on post, 80% of our emissions are vehicles. Yes. And so this week I'm going in a road show because we've already also, made... I'm actually intrigued think one of the 20% that are not vehicles. The 20% <laughs> <laughs> that's really... not vehicles is, is probably hot air for me or something, but it's... Uh, <laughs> um, it's only about five. It's only about five. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, the vehicles is, kind of you know, we've, that we've made Dublin all electric. It's the first city in the world to have all electric postal uh, deliveries. Yeah. And this week we'll be down in Galway and be down in Limerick and we'll be announcing those. So that's examples of, of you know, it's actually about making the big moves to do it. The building out of the networks in in air, the fantastic programs that, that Caroline's been leading and the team have been leading, I mean, that is transformative. And, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things in the years ahead is, is I'd like to think that the companies, rather than the companies being the, the Facebooks and the Googles, and people will start talking again about, you know, we didn't see this, we didn't see this coming with air, that it's actually moved us from being a country to one of the lowest levels of broadband to one of the best broadband countries in Europe. Um, that one in post, we've got one of the best logistics con connectivities in Europe. But we do it in a way that's very human, that's very Irish, that connects people, and that's what ESG is. It's not, it can't be, it can't be put into this ghetto of one person in an organization mm -hmm. having to look after it. it. Has to be owned by the CEOs, by the boards of the organizations. And you know, there's many board members from, from AIR here, and they very much own the whole sustainability agenda. That's the, it's it's absolutely vital that. So, so I think it's unquestionable. So when we when we when we because I mean it is something that initially it was dismissed as this is uh, sort of a, a soft wishy washy reaction to the kind of craziness of you know, the shareholder value at all costs, right? Um, but it the thing the amazing thing about culture is it changes so quickly, and then it's a permanent change. And if you're behind that change, you're gone, you know, and you become very toxic very quickly with no way back. I mean, can we push it forward? For, I mean, in terms of big trends you're seeing, because you're, you know, you're, you're working in this sector that, as you said, I thought it was very, very good behind every airplane is a large mortgage. Can I use that? That's, that's really good. I'm, next podcast. There I was thinking about airplanes and airplane uh, finance. Uh, boom, boom. Uh, but, you know, Look, looking forward to the next five or ten years, you know, you 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 worried about your children not doing IT, likewise, uh, but they're doing something else. I, I, I probably end up having to write an essay this weekend or help write one in order to keep some lad in college, you know, because <laughs> it's like they're about that far away from dropping out every weekend. Um, but that apart, parental problems apart, when you when you look out, what fills you with hope? Where do you think the good stuff is coming from? I think the good stuff is innovation. Um, okay. Just the constant change. Like we all look back at our own parents and we kind of say like, you know, look at the things that they saw. You referenced 1980s or, um, or 1990s earlier on. Yeah, this country in the 70s and 80s was a no-go area. We were totally dependent on foreign direct investment. Now we've got companies that are organically coming together and <coughs> organically born. So. You know, I think there's fantastic hope for the, the future in terms of technology, in terms of, I do think that the whole ESG agenda is really going to drive a focus. I think the activist groups are going to put pressure. I think, you know, the, the financiers are going to put pressure and that's all for the better. It's all for the goodness of society. But I think that's going to just drive a huge wave of innovation. And it, companies will be measured by scores. There will be frameworks in place so you'll have to tangibly do it, not just kind of pay lip service to it. So I think the culture of society will change hugely. I really think that if you take the SG agenda really, really strongly and you couple that with the experiences right now of global shortages, whether it's ship shortages, logistical issues in terms of, you know, transit of goods across the globe because of COVID, maybe we get a rebalancing of manufacturing back into these regions as well, where we shipped everything out because it was low cost. Yeah. Maybe sourcing locally is the answer for the future that gives you more geographical balance across all goods and sectors and not just kind of rely on labour. And that brings everybody's quality of life up because low labour, you know, shipping stuff to low cost regions, it keeps people down in some respects. Yes, it brings people out of poverty, 
but to keep the labour moving and keep the industries there, you're keeping salaries down. You want all societies to come up. You want new industries and new countries to evolve. And I really think that that's going to be the future. I think that's, I'm really optimistic. Yeah, no, I think it's very well said. I always think that economists make this terrible mistake. They don't realise that actually high wages is the goal. Yeah. That's where you want to be. You know, you go to somewhere like Switzerland, and the reason it's expensive is because they get, they get paid well. You know, and this idea that there's some sort of conflict that we have to obsess about profits all the time, you actually know the, the objective of good economics is that everybody does well and everyone can do well. And that's something that I think is very much part of the agenda, which I, I welcome fantastically now as, as an employee. No, no, as uh, no, but no, seriously, as somebody who, who, who see, looks around and says, this obsession with profits is absolutely crucial but it can't be primary all the time. Now we've got a good few questions coming in from online. I'm going to bundle them together and I'm going to throw them out if, 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 if you don't mind. How well, this is something you touched on Fiona, is the education system responding to the demand for new skill requirements in areas such as cloud and cyber security? I'm going to bundle this again. Air Evo have an office in New Zealand. Can you elaborate on the role that this plays for the business? Uh, do you expect competitors to follow suit with the merger? I'm just putting them together so we can grab each one as soon as we go. How can technology support businesses to become more sustainable? We've discussed that, remove carbon operations. And with the speeds being achieved, achieved in 5G, do you think connectivity could move entirely to mobile networks? Interesting questions. And by the way, if you want to ask questions at home, in the chat room, you'll see a place and just drop them in and they'll come up to be here. So again, by all means, if there's something on your mind at home, by all means, just jot it down and it'll come to me here. So, uh, where we go? Maybe I'll take the New Zealand yeah, Martin, one. Go for um, it. Just because I want to go down and visit them, obviously, as soon as possible. <laughs> um, I mean, when we had a look at the, the thing we were chatting to Everest, this was kind of struck as a beginning as a little peculiar, right? And then when you actually got it explained to you, it was genius, right? It was really, really sharp. And it's another example of innovation, really, in effect, right? So if you're taking on managed service contracts for big kind of customers and things like that, right, you have to have a really high level of standards and you have to have a real high level of kind of expertise working those contracts and being able to maintain the systems and so on. But doing that on a 24-7 basis is difficult and it becomes very difficult in an Irish labour market where you're trying to get really high qualified engineers to work night shifts and things like that, right? So to deliver the level required, that was becoming more and more difficult. So what the guys in Evers were very clever at, they kind of recognised that early and started to look then this kind of a follow the sun type of philosophy. How could we get somewhere with good language skills, good engineering skills, all of those things, and where would we stand up an office to do that? That led them to New Zealand. So, I mean, that, that office has been up and running up for well over a year. There's a large number of customers in the customer base that are using that. We just flip over seamlessly to that kind of a thing. Okay. So it's initially something that seemed a little bit, why would you do that? It's not, it's a complete selling point for us now, right? Because we, it's up and running, it's fully grown, and I'd expect that New Zealand office to kind of grow and thrive going forward, that we'd be winning more and more business and we'd be doing more and more things down there. So it was actually a very smart um, thing to do. I think one of the other questions was about would other people kind of do it in the market? I mean, possibly. I mean, yeah, I think from our perspective, yeah, I think from our perspective, the move that we've made here is, is such a kind of complementary one, right? And so it's a kind of significant one. I think it positions us very well. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if other kind of organisations start to look to do and bring things together because a, a partnership is one thing having it all in your own kind of remit is another. So I think you may see things, but you know, from our perspective, we're very pleased with the, with the kind of move we've made. What's out there and yeah. other companies. I mean, I think, you know, that's the, this is the Champions League of mergers. There may be a few Vauxhall Conference ones, but I, I really don't, I don't. So I, I you know, I think because we, we looked, we yeah, looked we what, you know, and, and yeah. Everest did sort of stand out or whatever. So, so for me, I, you know, I think, you know, this yeah, is a combination that's going to be difficult yeah, yeah. to beat. To beat. Yeah, thanks. And as a customer of, Everest for you know five years now actually one of the wins for us was that New Zealand presence and I think one of the secret sauce ingredients that was sending out some of the Irish guys to set that up because they brought with them the knowledge of the customer base yes and it gave us a follow of the sun and where we have offices in you know eastern locations as well and New Zealand often are the crowd that actually support our yeah, Singapore office you know so there are synergies and again, there's great talent pool in New Zealand when it comes to IT. Um, but I do think putting Irish guys out there to bring the experience and the knowledge of the customer base 
was a very clever move. And it helps a lot. And is, is that it's just, it's just even the it's just it's just almost the way in which they approached the, the issue. But it, no, it's, it's it's intimate customer knowledge because having been on site with certainly ourselves, you know, the 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 head guy out there, Gary Corley, had actually spent time in our office. All right, so he knows so you guys. He, underst he yes. understood the infrastructure. He knew exactly how it was built. So you're bringing that intimate knowledge to them. He knows the kind of the culture of the company, which is really important because what works for us as a company culturally may be very, very different to what would work for on post or for some other customer. So again, just kind of that understanding of cultural differences because yeah. culture eats strategy for it's breakfast. It's that, that customer DNA I was talking about. It's that kind of thing as well, right? It's understanding that and then having the kind of guts to go do it, right? And to kind of make yeah. it happen. No, I, you know? I can see in, in on post and people don't always know my in Impost, they don't always know I'm in uh, uh, in air, uh, the chairman of air, and uh, I could see when the merger was announced, I could see emails going around our technology people saying, "Wow, have you seen this?" They were oh, this, this is, a, this is a big move. This is a big move, and uh, so I think back to Caroline's point, this is this was seen as something which actually really can change what can be delivered here in Ireland. So I think it's fantastic, and I should also, by the way, as chair, I should absolutely acknowledge. Uh, Air shareholders, NJJ, who, uh, uh, you know, French telecom uh, equity investors, and they very much lead with technology, and they lead with technology to simplify and to simplify businesses, and it's a fantastic uh, strategy with which Caroline is leading to do that. So, you know, you, you do see these things, there's, there's, there's a number of things moving around here yep. that mean we end up with a much better solution. Yeah. Vision the way that you've been talking around what can happen. You know, it's 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 different territories, different places, how things can work. Um, so yeah, very exciting. Do you want me to take the five G one, or are we okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. So I, I suppose you know, you you have seen recently you know seventy um, percent five G population coverage, and obviously from a mobile experience point of view, it's ten times faster than four four uh, G. It's really low, ultra low latency, which means so for real time, you know, applications, it's it's really fantastic yes. and, and great capacity. So so it's 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 a hugely innovative um, network, and we've made it available to everybody there recently as well. So which is fantastic. However, uh, having a fiber connection, and even though I started my career in mobile, I just I always go back to the fixed part of the network because it's, it's our kind of DNA. Having a fiber connection directly into your home. I don't think anything's gonna gonna beat that. You know, it's a gig today. It'll be two gigs. It'll be ten gigs. And if you think about it, when we're finished our our role, our our one billion euro investment, we have 83% of the premises in Ireland will have the direct fibre connection. And when MBI are finished, we'll be up close to 100%. And that'll put Ireland, you know, up with the likes of the Singapore's so or whatever. Will that put us really close Absolutely. to the top of the league? We'll be super top in Europe, but across the world will be top. And I think once you have that direct connection in, yeah. then whatever application comes, whatever device, whatever laptop, you'll be able to take advantage of that. So it's not to diss mobile. We love mobile. We're spending a lot of money on mobile and we have the best 5G network in the country. But I do think, you know, uh, that fibre network directly into your home is going to future proof, you know, Ireland or whatever. And we've also seen during the pandemic, pandemic that demand, people don't write to me anymore and say, I want fibre, they want fibre to the home. They know yeah. what they want, they know what's the best and they know it's kind of future proofed or whatever. So so I think, uh, yeah, mobile's great, but there's definitely, you know, um, fixed is the new mobile. Fixed is, is the new mobile. <laughs> fixed is the new mobile. Now, uh, we're going to open it up to the floor in a sec. Uh, Megan, Megan, you've got a, a mic. Who, we, we can just chat here, we can bring this to the close, but also who from the floor has a question for anybody here on the panel? This is all your business. You must have a few questions about I'm sure where Phillip, this I'm merger sure is going. Over there. Philip always has a question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Philip O'Mara, a regional director of Air Evo Northern Ireland. Um, would the panel have any comments about the opportunities in Northern Ireland as well? Because it's a great day for the team in Belfast and our customers in Northern Ireland, and we look to the future with optimism as well. So maybe if the panel wants to comment on that. Well, I start and yeah, let me jump in. Uh, I suppose again, and, and, and David's mentioned it, our, our shareholders. You know, and AJ bought us four years ago, and we kind of looked at all our businesses and we looked at our our business in Northern Ireland. And again, there's there's a conversation there. You you know, is it big enough? You know, do you divest from it or do you you decide to expand it? And the decision was made <laughs> to expand our kind of business in Northern Ireland to to roll out some of the products that we have in in the south, in the north, and also to invest in network infrastructure. So we're 
very optimistic. And as well with Brexit now, I suppose we have a foot in both camps as well. So, you know, I think we think that's a really good strategy and we're very yeah. optimistic and we're actually going to be in Belfast tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a bit of a homework question, Philip. <laughs> but but um, do you know what? The, the bit that gets me a bit Northern Ireland most is our shareholders, the guy that kind of leads our shareholders. I've never met somebody more enthusiastic about this all island prospect, right? And he's French. He's the French right? shareholders. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's so enthusiastic about it, right? To the point he's it's almost... Just well, English. he's almost insulting if you don't share this enthusiasm. Do you know this way? But he's, he's absolutely... And he's so kind of convinced and convincing about the potential in Northern Ireland, right? So I think it's not that we didn't have that, but when somebody kind of drives that agenda so strongly... Maybe and the will... It's huge, yeah. a real challenger. So and we're a small business. So this is a sort of a, a, yeah. a bean is bottle almost. Yeah, so somebody can outside looking in, right? But if you think of it, we're a small business in Northern Ireland at the moment, right? And he's just saying about this whole like, innovation, you're almost like a startup. Like, think of the things you can do here. You know, you're backed, we have investment, we're looking to grow the business and hire. We're bringing an amazing portfolio of products now to the market up there that wasn't there previously. So everything is a kind of positive thing that, that, that's going in common there. Was, there. there was a report yesterday, um, I think it was the SRI, there was a report yesterday that said trade from Britain, and we know it, and I'm positive we can see it, trade from Britain is down 45% into Ireland. I mean, really stunning drop. And it's up something like 97% cross-border from Northern Ireland. Um, so, you know, that shift has happened. And, and the shift into an all-island economy has happened. It's happening right now. So, uh, absolutely, the potential is fantastic. Uh, yeah, for, absolutely. And I suppose we were, a dis uh, we were a disruptor here when we launched GOMO. And we have a huge opportunity to be disruptive in yeah, the north yeah. because we have a smaller business that's not regulated so we can you know we can try some new things up there so i think we're yeah. all kind of we're hiring about that. as well we're looking to bring in new people in, in northern ireland as well so it's a really exciting future in northern ireland because it's a real wide open vista for us to, to get don't in. worry i'm married to somebody from i know, <laughs> I, know <laughs> I know the drill i know the gig <laughs> i've had those conversations <laughs> i've heard when our kids were very very young we used to have a competition of counting the union jacks uh, when we after we go over the border and we got to a classic i think it was in one of the 2006 marching seasons and we got 172 which was pretty good going that's a not good bad, commitment it's a good commitment to the cause yeah. which was and, and there was no double counting yeah. and we were fine they were fine the many reps so i i know that i so that's that's another word but interestingly it, it's very soon to be maybe even constitutionally our world yeah and we better get used to it yeah. You know, this is a big question. We, we've got to, we've got to think uh, in in that context. Absolutely, and, and, and I see it again as another thing that the, the downsides are so evident. Sometimes the upsides are a little bit more obscure, and you have to figure them out. We've just another question in from home. Where do the panelists see the big opportunities for Air Evo being in the market in the next two to five years? So I, I think it's largely kind of pushing on with what we're doing. Right? I think the whole move to the cloud and the whole kind of digital transformation journey is massive. And you've co companies at very different stages of that. You know, smaller companies are a bit more embryonic. Larger companies are, are better formed. But it's such a big journey. You know, so I think there's still a lot to go to that. Cyber security is, is huge, right? And just having the confidence to work with somebody that really understands that. I mean, it's like security to me is like a practice. It's not a product, you know, there's so much that goes around it in terms of consultancy and different things, you know, you, you really have to build it out in a developed way. So I think that's going to be there. And I think the, the move to the, the whole managed service thing is going to happen more. So I think organisations are looking for companies they can trust. You know, we trust you to take this on in our behalf, run it, manage it, and you know, and that you feel as passionately about it as we do. So a lot of the things we're doing, and then there'll be things in innovation. Do you know, I think business process innovation is going to be a big thing now as, as automation and things starts to kick in. How can you improve those processes through technology? I think the use of apps will grow, right? And I think being able to spin them off quickly and kind of get them into your organisational thing. So there's a lot, there's a lot coming, but I think those things generally, I would think from our perspective. Caroline, would you like a last word on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with Martin. I said, I'm very optimistic about the managed services because I do think, you know, companies are, you know, getting very focused uh, and they and they want a one-stop shop and they want someone they can trust and they want the whole portfolio covered and never has security been more on everyone's agenda. So I, I think there's, you know, we have some great managed service customers today, the Musgraves and the AIBs in this world or whatever, but I think there's a huge opportunity for us to bring on, you know, more bigger customers there yeah. and whatever. So I'd be very excited about that. Yeah. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to have, before we go, before we go, and for yourselves at home, 
Uh, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank, obviously, Martin, who's been up here for half the morning. Big round of applause thank for you. Martin. Fiona, David, and Caroline. Thank you. Really, really fascinating. I've, I've, I've actually was taking notes. I've got at least four articles from the little bit of wisdom. I was contemplating now 5G the other day. Do you know? So it'll be all good. So when you see me spoofing about that, you know I'm just sucking information <laughs> out of everybody else. For yourselves at home, I hope you enjoyed our discussion, our launch. I hope you are energized about what is possible. And stay with us because we have a time lapse outside, which will be the unveiling of the brand, I am told. This is a little bit of those sort of moments where the astronaut is talking to the ground control and doesn't really know whether the landing crew is there or the landing deck is out, but hopes. So if you stay with us, but uh, apart from that, thank you all very much for being with us. And thank you all very much for being with us here in Cherrywood. Thank you very much.